It is 6.30 in the morning and I drastically underestimated the temperature of today. You see, for the last few weeks, we've had glorious sunshine and it's been super warm. Assuming that would still be the case, I came out with no extra layers. I'm hoping, I'm really hoping it only gets warmer from here because it is pretty cold. The temperature, however, is not the only challenge that we're facing today. As photographers, we tend to have our go-to equipment, the equipment that we use on a regular basis, that we know super well and never have to worry about using because we know it like the back of our hands. This, however, can get us into a pattern of always taking the same photos in the same way. And so today, I've chosen to take out a different lens and I'm gonna do a different style of photography to see how that will grow me as a photographer and my ability to use the equipment that I normally leave on the shelf. So the camera that we're going to be using today is the Canon 7D Mark II. I use this camera relatively often, but the lens is a Sigma 105 mm macro lens. Now this is a prime lens, so you cannot zoom it. It's always at 105 millimeters. And the word macro is what we're going to be exploring today. You see, a macro lens lets you get super close to tiny subjects. And this is an aspect of wildlife that I don't often experiment with. So today I'm gonna to be learning lots about how to use a macro lens and how to use it out here in the field. I've got a couple of gadgets with me that are gonna help me along the way, and I'm gonna bring you along. If you enjoy this video, make sure to hit that like and subscribe. If you have any questions or tips for me about macro photography, pop them in the comments below. And without further ado, let's start shooting. The sun has fully risen now and it's starting to blind me a little bit, but for macro photography, it's very helpful. For macro photography, light is the key. And along a hedgerow like this, you're gonna find lots of little insects, whether they'll be sitting on plants or feeding. Sometimes the plants themselves will also look pretty cool. Now the sun is directly in front of me and I'm thinking of using this sun as a backlight so that I can get the rims of these insects lit up to bring them out from the background. The only problem is I haven't found any insects in this hedgerow yet. So I'm gonna start looking and fingers crossed, we'll find a really cool insect that we can use this great lighting on. And this hedgerow here has been fantastic, especially for catching flies. We've had multiple flies landing on these fern plants here. And with the sun coming through, sometimes it will shine through the fern bushes. It will be a backlight. There's lots of flies with kind of a bright sunlight or an outline, which I'm really happy with because that's what we wanted to get. There's also just some cool pictures of the ferns and the way the ferns have so many layers means there's lots of bokeh behind and in front of the flies. So we're now gonna go and look for some more interesting insects. We're gonna look for some 
some more creepy crawlies. And I forgot to say at the beginning of this video, if you don't like insects or creepy crawlies, then this isn't the one for you. Also, if you like doing macro photography, but you don't like flies buzzing around your head, you're gonna have to rethink your life choices because while I was down here, there was constant buzzing around my head. Behind me here, I just have a very small patch of overgrown grass, nettles, and fern. I walk past this every time I come out on a photography trip, but I've never stopped to look at it in detail. And that's one of the things I'm really enjoying about the macro photography. I'm walking past hedges and I'm scanning the nettles for insects and it's bringing this kind of excitement and fascination out of the shrubs that are normally just weeds. In amongst this lot, there was a stem of grass. It was one of these. In fact, the insect is actually still here. I'm not sure what the insect is called, and that's another thing I'm noticing. I really don't know my insects whatsoever. So if you know what any of these species are, pop the time tag in the comments below tell me what species they are because I would love to learn. But on one of these bits of grass, there was a little fly and it's going around, um, I, I'm assuming pollinating, it's, it's eating the nectar from the tops of these grass stems and with the sun, and then there's a tree in the background so it's not an overlit sky. I've been able to take multiple angles. I've been able to really experiment with taking the photos. And so I think now it's a good time for me to tell you a bit about the settings you can be using when doing macro photography and how to adapt them to get the best photos. Today I've been using manual focus, which I would recommend when doing macro photography. And there's three settings which you have to control. There's shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. And I'm gonna talk you through the ranges that I've been using on these three settings so you can understand the settings that are appropriate for the different situations. So the sun has come out and it's coming in and out, but it has been relatively stable. While the sun's been out, I've been shooting on a shutter speed of about 300. My aperture has been around eight and my ISO has been about 250 or lower, depending if I'm shooting into the sunlight or if I'm using the light and shooting away from the sun. This has managed to get me photos like these, where you can see it's really well lit, there's beautiful contrast, and everything is in crisp focus and there's not much noise. While the sun has been away, while it's been behind clouds, I've had to compromise the settings a little bit to add in an extra bit of light to make sure that the photos are still sharp, they're still crisp. I've brought my shutter speed down. It's been on about 150 for some of the time, which I think is a little bit low for this kind of photography. With macro photography, because you're so close to the subject and the plant they're on is probably swaying in the wind, a tiny bit of movement turns out to be quite a big bit of movement when your subject is that tiny. So 150 is a bit low, but when you burst mode, and on this camera, the Canon 7D Mark II, I can burst 10 photos a second, it's been okay because I've been taking a bunch of photos and some of them are sharp. The aperture has been down to about five. Now, the aperture when doing macro photography is again, something you've got to be careful of. Now, if I was shooting a picture of the farm behind me with this camera, a aperture of 2.8, which is the lowest aperture this camera can have, is fantastic. It lets in so much light, you'd get a decent bit of bokeh in there. However, when you're doing macro photography, because you're so close to the subject, you actually have to have your aperture quite wide. Otherwise, the entire thing will be out of focus. You'll have like one hair on the fly in focus. So it goes down to five, which still gets the insect relatively in focus and allows more light in for when the sun disappears like it has now. 
The ISO has been going up to about 500 when we've had it in the shade, which isn't ideal. I like to keep that 300 or below, but at 500, there still is minimal noise and it allows you to get decent photos in the shade. The other thing you can do is use flash. Now, if you've watched other people do macro photography, if you've watched professional macro photographers, which I'll admit I'm not, they'll have these huge flashes, these huge lighting setups, and that allows them to get really cool photos in darker situations. They can build their own contrast. They can add shadows and lights and darks, and it helps them to really light up the subject. Well, every camera pretty much has a built-in flash, and this flash is not very sufficient. It doesn't provide too much light, but in a dark situation, it will light up the subject. And if it's an insect with a shell, for example, this awesome blue beetle that I found on a plant, I, I don't think this beetle should be in the UK. It looks way too colorful and cool. Well, I was using the flash to get the kind of luminescence on the shell and it made it really nice and clear. I took pictures without the flash, which are here, and I took pictures with the flash, such as this one. The disadvantage of using a flash is with most cameras, you cannot do burst mode and a flash. And if you can, it's significantly reduced, which for macro photography can make it difficult. Using the burst mode on the camera also helps with getting the photos in focus. You see, with macro photography, you're working with such a tiny depth of field. It's such a marginal focus that you have for such a tiny subject that often as the branch is swaying or as the camera is just moving or as you're trying to focus it, the insect will go way out of focus and getting it in focus and keeping it there is almost impossible. So with burst mode, you can burst a series of photos while swaying your camera back and forward. And by doing that, you're allowing the camera to take a bunch of photos at different intervals. And because you're physically moving the camera forward and backwards, that marginal focal range is also moving up and down the subject. If you burst 10 or so photos while moving it slowly forward and slowly backwards, there is a high chance that one of them will be in focus. This is a technique that I've been using today and it really helps as opposed to sitting there for hours and hours trying to get the focus and using a tripod and, and the plant, which is just nonstop going to move, it really helps. So that's a technique that I would take away if you want to go and do macro photography. Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned a little gadget that I had brought with me and I realized I haven't got it out yet. Well, this is a tiny little light. I can fully control this light to make it lighter or darker and do different colors. And as I was talking about earlier, the, the light in macro photography is one of the key aspects. So I'm now going to be using this light for my last bunch of photos to see if we can get some cool effects. I can bring the light from different angles or I can use it to fill in if the sun is being too bright behind, for example. I can also make it an orangey light to try and get a sunset vibe. Honestly, I have no idea what I'm gonna do with it, but I'm gonna go away and experiment and I'll show you the results. Down here in front of me, I have a ladybird. Now you may have seen my ladybird photo from earlier and that was a very red ladybird, whereas this one is much more orange. It's much more of a, a washed out ladybird, if I can say that. And the orange tone of its shell would work really well with that sunset or sunrise idea I had earlier. So on this light, I'm going to see about changing the temperature. It's very white at the moment, and that's going more white. Okay, let's make it yellow. Now you probably won't be able to see this on that camera because it'll probably just adjust it. However, this light is significantly more orange now, if you can see on my hand. So if I now hold that near the ladybird, I'm thinking we can make that kind of point at an angle to get a really nice orange glow. So let's see what we can do.
genuinely, I've had such fun doing macro photography, which is something I didn't think I'd say at the end of this video. I always do wildlife photography if you haven't been here before, and so doing macro photography seems like a whole different realm. It's, it's a very different concept to wildlife photography. You're looking for such tiny things and you actually don't have to go to huge extents to find them because they're often in grassy verges like this one. That being said, the excitement has been beyond what I thought it would be and I've learned a lot about my own skills as a macro photographer. So if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like and subscribe and I will see you in the next one.